So welcome everyone, good evening. Welcome to the very first of the California Garden and Landscape His History Society's 2020 online lecture series. Thank you for joining us. My name is Eleanor. I'm a member of CGLHS and I'm a historian based in San Francisco. I'm here to introduce our speaker and help facilitate the event. Tonight we're joined by David Laws. He's the vice president of CGLHS. He lives in Monterey, California, and he'll be speaking about the life and impact of a man named Hayes Perkins, who is responsible for the magic carpet of purple flowers along the bluffs of Pacific Grove. The talk is based on an article entitled Hayes Perkins, the Magic Carpet Man that was published in our winter 2019 issue of Eden, which is our quarterly journal. You can see a few copies here. Since this is our first Zoom meeting, I hope you'll bear with us as we sort of test the limits of our account. And I do want to issue one word of warning. Uh, myself in San Francisco and a few of our other organizers are experiencing intermittent power outages. So I, I really apologize in advance if this meeting gets cut off for any reason, if one of us loses power. And I just urge you to wait a moment and try and um, log back in again. Uh, the lecture will extend for approximately 40 minutes, and we ask that you save questions until the end when we'll be having some discussion time. Uh, please keep yourselves on mute and put your questions in the chat box, and myself and a few other moderators will be monitoring the chat box and we'll facilitate that discussion. Uh, we'll try and keep the full program to an hour and end right at 7 o'clock. And if you're new, to CGLHS. If you're not a member, I encourage you to go and check out our website, cglhs.org, where you can find more information about the organization and the other programs that we're offering this fall and our past and future conferences, which is how I got um, interested and involved in the organization because they're really great events. So with that, I will hand it over to David and we'll get started with our formal presentation. Okay, let's see if we can get the screen share up. How does that look to you, Eleanor? It looks good, David. Good. Well, thank you for joining us in the first of our uh, online lecture series. Uh, the next lecture will be on September 23rd, and there will be a third lecture on October the 21st. And depending on the success and acceptance of this, we will uh, plan additional uh, talks uh, into next year. So today I'd like to, uh, well, why don't I give you a little a view of uh, this is what it looks like outside right now in Monterey. The ash is from three fires burning around us, a uh, major fire over in the Salinas Valley, one down in Carmel Valley and one in Big Sur. And uh, this is the strange view of the sky. Uh, the sun is actually an orange color that doesn't show on the photograph, but um, that's uh, what we see when I look out of the window right now. So I'd like to tell you about the life and times of Hayes Perkins. I don't know how many of you know of Pacific Grove and have visited here, but basically we're a, a small residential community, I think of about 15,000 people, um, residential and resort uh, community, uh, squeezed between Monterey, Pebble Beach, and Carmel. This town has had uh, quite an interesting cast of unique characters over the uh, decades. Um, we had, uh, I think, one of the first female lighthouse keepers for 23 years back in the late 1800s. Um, uh, Julia Platt was the a mayor of uh, Pacific Grove in the 1920s, who basically played a major, major role in uh, early conservation movements are coming back on pollution of the bay. Uh, and then many, many other characters, so writers, artists, um, philosophers, uh, notably John Steinbeck, Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, John Denver crashed his airplane here, and even Bill Gates has had an influence on the town, but that's another whole other story. Um, today, uh, I'd like to tell you about a lesser known individual. Um, who's had an even more significant impact on our town uh, by enticing visitors from around the world for the last 70 years. My interest in Hayes Perkins uh, aroused when I started researching the article that uh, Eleanor mentioned for 
uh, publication in Eden and that was published in the 29, winter 29 edition of Eden. Uh, Perkins Park is about a one mile strip of coastal bluff overlooking the Monterey Bay. That over a period of 14 years in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, he's basically single-handedly transformed into a dazzling springtime carpet of fluorescent pink blooms. Um, but the more I read, the more I realized uh, that the story of Mr. Perkins uh, was far bigger and much more interesting than simply the creation of his magic carpet. He was a man of humble birth and limited education who for 50 years worked his way around the world as a manual laborer. Yet he had the imagination and discipline and skill in fact to keep a detailed diary of his travels that offer a unique working man's perspective on life, politics, travel, racial and social inequality, war and worldwide travel of his era. So this is the uh, front page of that article and a picture of uh, how Perkins Park appeared, I believe this was taken about 1961. So Mr. Perkins, Henry Hayes Perkins, FRGS, Fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, uh, born in Oregon in 1878, and he died here in Pacific Grove in 1964. He was an adventurer. He worked his way around the world, as I said, basically using his hand and his strong back, just as a manual laborer. As a diarist, he made detailed notes of his travels, uh, which were published in an extremely limited edition, as we'll see in a minute of five, um, in 1961. And as a gardener, again, a self-taught gardener, um, I, there are very little information in other gardens that he has worked on, although there is a nice description of one uh, that he developed for the Heart of Africa mission in the Congo in 1914, um, uh, an important park that he helped develop in Pennsylvania, and of course, Perkins Park here in Pacific Road. Some, just some general sort of background quickly. We'll go over these in more detail later. These are milestones in what he described himself as a bird, in the life of how he described himself as a bird of passage. Now, he was born in 1878 uh, to homesteading parents, very humble upbringing. At age 15, he left school and began life on the road to escape, frankly, appalling abuse by his father. In 1898, he takes his first of 130 documented ocean voyages around the world by sailing around Cape Horn in a four-master. His first visit to Africa was in Nigeria in 1907. And in 1928, at age 50, after 30 years on the road, uh, he begins work at Hearst Castle, just about 70 miles south of where I'm sitting tonight. 1936, he did the work in in Butler, Pennsylvania that I mentioned. And in 1937, he was inducted as a member of the Royal Geographical Society of London, uh, based on the recommendations of Frank Preston, who was employing him and realized that there was such a trove of information in his work and, and, and in his life. Uh, I think it was the only uh, formal organization that he joined throughout his life. In 1938, he moved here to Pacific Grove. 43, he retired and began work on is now called Perkins Park. Um, and he worked on that for about 14 or 15 years. He did take two other journeys, one to North Africa and one South America during his time here. And in 61, the diaries were typed and bound um, here as here and there. And in 1964, he died at Forest Hill Manor, the retirement home here in Pacific Grove. This is one of the five copies of the formal copies of the diaries that exist. Uh, bound in three thick tomes, actually five volumes, covering the period 1878 to 1936. Uh, we do have one copy in the public library here in Pacific Grove. There's one with the Royal Ge Geographical Society in London, one with the National Geographical Society in uh, New York, one in Historical Society in Oregon, and one at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo that I will mention later on. Um, and these were as many carbon copies as they could get. These were hand typed in 1961, as it turns out, um, on a very thin paper, 2,000 pages of it. Uh, just a fascinating compendium of 50 years of his life. It's very well documented, great table of contents, great table of contents, uh, excellent index and is just an incredible view of the world 
uh, that uh, from the perspective of a working man for that period. Um, I'm going to read you that page on the right, which is obviously very difficult for you, even difficult for me to read on the copy that I have, uh, to give you a sense of his voice. Um, there are a few other passages I'll read during the talk. Um, and if you really want to get into it, come to Pacific Grove and go to the reference department and you can read all 2,000 pages over several weeks. Okay, here and there. When a man writes his own biography, it is conceded he is a liar. So it is well to admit this fault at the beginning. However, for those who read between the lines, they might find some modicum of truth in its pages. Approaching the sundown of life, I wonder how to record the happenings of the fleeting years, what to put in, what to leave out. There has to be a beginning, as I have no idea of selling this at a profit, will care little what those who may peruse it may say or think. It is a mere statement of facts and near facts, as I have seen things. I was born on February the 10th, 1878, of Native American parents, meaning American-born parents of European origin, who are also children of natives. My father was Scotch-English, chiefly the first, my mother, French-Irish combination, and out of these, I drew an English name. Where my ancestors arrived in North America, I know not. They were among the first from Europe, settling in Virginia and North Carolina, driven from their homelands by religious persecution, like so many more at that time, and who wished to live their lives without the dictation of the priests or the feudal barons at enmity with their neighbors. I'm turning to page eight, um, just to give a little indication. He was a, an, an avid reader and loved to read about adventurers. And this is where he learned about Africa. Um, so, and what he says here, um, oh yes, that's right. Many people moving into the area would stop by their house and talk about their times of travel and abroad. Um, and he said, need I say many of these tales and the books of Africa turned me wild. Until chased to bed, I would sit in the corner of the fireplace listening open mouthed to the thrilling personal adventures of these men of their longing to be Stanley. It's of course, Stanley, the uh, explorer in Africa. I feared all the elephants and cannibals would be killed off before I might be old enough to assist in the game. Even when driven to the upstairs garret, I would slip back and hide in the shadows, shivering in the cold of winter, still listening, listening. So I hope that gives you a sense of uh, Perkins and his... Uh, slide I'm showing here is from a website, Hayes Here and There, um, that has been put together by Perkins, as far as I can figure out, that uh, John Martin is the Perkins cousin's great grandson, or something very distinct like that. And what John has done, and he has actually a Xerox copy of the complete diary, he has gone on this website and done basically a synopsis of every major event for, for volumes one and two. I think he had planned to do all five volumes, but I think that basically got beyond him. But it has given me a very easy way to sort through and look at the areas of interest. And in fact, this is his synopsis of Perkins' travels during the period of 1878 to 1907 that are contained in volume one. I'm not going to read all this to you, and I don't expect you to read it either, but just a sense here, um, account of his life after leaving home, mining and ranching in the western U.S., his travels. Um, he was actually in Alaska twice with the U.S. Geological Survey, making some of the first, earliest maps of Alaska. Um, and uh, towards the end of this volume, uh, he ends up in, mahogany, in, in Nigeria logging mahogany. Uh, this is a map of just some of the travels during the period of 1893 to 1907. So this is age 15 to age 30 uh, that John put together on his website. And you can see during that period, he was a busy guy, twice round the horn, many times across the um, Atlantic, um, traveling up to Alaska up at the top left and traveling down to Nigeria at the lower right, his uh, travels in that period. Um, let's just take a look at a couple of uh, the adventures he had. Each, many of these adventures could be a movie or a book in of themselves. Um, sailing around the Horn on a three-masted schooner. Um, in 1898, um, he joined uh, the, the crew of a, a schooner. Um, it just aged 20, um, that uh, four-masted. 
um, going round the Horn uh, with some pretty incredible weather. And uh, let's see. So, and he talks uh, at some length about the difficulties on board, well past the Horn, but the weather is worse than ever. So great is the rocking and pitching of the ship, the gallery is washed out. No food can be cooked, and the best we expect is a pot of coffee. And this is one of the mildest descriptions of that adventure. Uh, from there, um, he ended up in England, came back, uh, was, uh, had many adventures along the way. Um, and the next one that we'll talk about is a short time he spent in Nigeria. And this is really just to point out his interest in Africa. And this was his first trip to Africa. Um, so it was relatively brief, about six months. Um, and uh, this is where he became aware of the appalling treatment of the natives by many of the, uh, particularly the Portuguese and the Belgian uh, owners of, of these lands at that time. As he describes here, the logs are hauled to the water with men. This requires at least a hundred men to drag a log of ordinary size to water. And when possible, whips are used on the men. And certainly that made uh, an impression on him because he had experienced so much of that as a child from his abusive father. Coming to volume two, you can see his travels extend further. This time he crosses the uh, Pacific. Yeah, I'm going to show one line here. I think he crossed the Pacific several times, across the Indian Ocean, um, and again into Africa. Quite a bit of time in Australia and New Guinea. And uh, the probably one of the more interesting adventures here, this would be his third uh, trip up to the Yukon, or his third trip to Alaska, where he uh, goes up to the Yukon uh, hoping to search for gold. Um, and he actually rows about 900 miles down the Yukon River uh, to return to San Francisco. Uh, he was unable to find gold there um, and realized running out of money, I think he had about $10 left at this point, um, he buys a boat for $5 and rows 900 miles down the Yukon River in uh, 12 days. Um, just a brief description. Um, uh, so he describes it here um, with his partner. He asked of his partner if he wanted to join him. Indeed, Foda did want to share my trip down river. Said he didn't know anything about cooking, but was a good oarsman. As to the first part of the statement, he trolled the truth. But in the last, he was alive. Anyway, we put to sea. We have 20 pounds of flour, 11 pounds of bacon, and two pounds of prunes. A coffee pot, a frying pan, two tin plates, some knives, forks, and spoons. What more does a man want on the Yukon? So that was 12 days, um, 900 miles. Now getting into volume two. Again, we don't have time to go through all the details of his travels. But one of the most significant uh, journeys that he made was he um, signed a two-year contract to serve as groundskeeper uh, at Evangelist C.T. Studs, heart of the Africa mission in the Belgian Congo. This was in 1915. Um, and uh, uh, his initial impression there is not, he's not well received. He is treated virtually like a slave. Uh, but he does do a, a lot of work with uh, the native people in building a garden. Um, and this is one of the few descriptions that we have of any of the garden work he does, which I will read for you. So this is May the 17th, 1941. Not a bad week, busy all the time, and daily the script estate grows more attractive. One can accomplish so much in a short time in a land like this, where all the produce grows an inch or two inches overnight. I have planted 1,100 bananas and plantains, 1,000 pineapples, and more than 200 fruit trees. And of course, all this was just by spade and hand, no mechanical help in those days. Um, I have six, let's uh, see. I have six varieties of mangoes which leap up from the seed in a few days. Avocados, pears, limes, lemons, oranges. Um, custard apples, it makes seven. These two from seed, and they're growing. Grass jumps up overnight, but the boys are on it with their hoes instantly. I have a lot of sweet potato growing on vast ant hills, one 30 feet high, the white ant, or termite, as you wish to call it. This is a good garden for many varieties of seed. 
So that was uh, the good part of his time um, at, the, at the mission. Um, but after six months, he realized that uh, the, he describes them as charlatans. Uh, he, he resigns due to the sub missionaries' abusive treatment, and basically their control of the natives with holding or providing alcohol. As he says, this experience with the missionaries has been the crowning blunder of my life. I find myself a servant to two charlatans, wholly self-seeking, while pretending to be self-sacrificed devotees to the cause of Christianity. Um, that's sad. So at this point, he had not completed his contract. He gets no money. He has to get back home. So what do you do if you're in the middle of the Congo in 1914 with no money? You start walking. Um, and basically, um, let's go back. Let's stay on this one here. And so here, um, he's walking through the, the uh, Turi jungle, I think it is, 700 miles he walks in 55 days, that's 12 miles a day. Um, basically, no money, um, manages to do odd jobs along the way, or you do an odd job in the jungle, I can't imagine. Uh, but he is really hungry at one time, is quite suffering. And two uh, people near him, um, understand his situation. Uh, the white man has nothing to eat, they said. And if a man does not eat, he will die. We have little, but we will share a little with him. And they did. For out of their small store of green plantains and watery sweet potatoes, they brought me the best, refusing to accept money in return. I will always remember this, for without it, I would have eaten nothing this day, nor until tomorrow, if then. It is an act of, com an act of comradeship, I have never seen unequaled during the starvation days at sea on the Yukon or anywhere else I have been. So that was uh, Perkins' uh, time in Africa. Uh, and from there, um, he travels, again, we're recognizing here, we're talking between 1907 and 1920. So we've got a period of 13 years. He covers a lot of ground again, uh, travels around the world. He's back in the US. Um, back up the Nile, and finally he uh, comes back to the Congo yet again, uh, where he works for the Fourmier Company in the Belgian Congo. Fourmier was the major Belgian absolutely, exploiter of, of the Belgian Congo, um, and he works there as a prospector for diamonds, and he's actually quite successful. Um, he, dis he knows what to look for in the geology, um, and he takes a crew of about a dozen uh, natives with him each time, and they're very loyal to him. Uh, he treats them well, um, doesn't abuse them, um, but pretty quickly the company realizes that what they can do is every time he has a new find, they can take his workers, move him onto a new site to find something else, um, and end up uh, in the kind of situation that is described in this passage from his, uh, his, uh, his diary about how diamonds were mined in those days. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but basically the wounds on the bodies of the pitmen were white, festered and gaping. Blood streamed with the mud, tinting it scarlet, while the bodies of the pit slaves moved spasmodically as the wits lit, and every bone in their emaciated bodies seemed to show through their skin. This is how we get diamonds. He tried several times to make the world aware of what was going on here. Leopold had been disposed long before. Belgium was supposed to be behaving, uh, but basically because of the publicity that he gave to it, um, he became um, blacklisted at the mines. So um, he continues his travels. Uh, he goes to Australia, uh, finding no work in Australia. Um, Uh, excuse me, I'm sorting out my papers here. There we go. So he's in Australia. Um, he's been unable to find work at this point. Uh, so once again, he realizes he needs to move on. Uh, and this is April the 23rd, 1923. I'm in Sydney again, and when ready, we'll go to the islands. The enchantment of the glorious... Uh, Samoan 
ensemble of forest and coral beach, of reef and bluest sea beckons, and surely will be a more desirable place of residence than the drab bush. Besides, I want to get away from the brutal slave gams of Africa and the equally hard driving machine age of the USA. Where else but the languorous beauty of the South Seas can this can be found? And he spent some time on Samoa, uh, actually quite close to Robert Louis Stevenson's house, uh, Valima, um, and ran a trading post for about five months. But even there, the realization uh, the world is not a happy place, almost anywhere for him. Uh, came. I came here to hide away from the selfishness, the greed, and the pain of the big outside world, but find it here in even greater force than in my own land. Uh, he found this when he was giving money to a family for their daughter, giving food for a family to their daughter who was suffering from TB. He later found out that, that they, would, they weren't going to waste the food on their dying daughter. They were going to eat it themselves. So he moves on. Um, and uh, again, continues to travel. Uh, as I said, he tries to go back to the Congo to mine again, but he's been blacklisted. So because of his outspoken description of what was going on. Um, and uh, came across this little piece in his diary. In 1924, he purchases a little Remington portable typewriter. Up until now, he'd been keeping his notes uh, in, in little notebooks. I guess he was having some of it typed up, but it, was costing him too much money. So he's brought a typewriter, a Remington portable, and he's delighted with it. I'm putting it every spare minute in my diary. Um, and I haven't seen examples of the typing that he did for his diary because that was retyped later on. But this is an example of a typical letter that he wrote to about a hundred people over the years. He had this. Uh, this particular letter is to his nephew Frank, uh, written in 1926. And you can see he doesn't waste a page, and quite often he types on both sides of the paper. So by 1928 or so, he realizes that basically at age 50, I think he is, he's getting too old, and he's got to find uh, another source and have a chance to build himself a little nest egg so he can retire later on. And he is, uh, gets a job at Hearst Castle. Uh, at the time when Hearst Castle was in the very early stages of uh, being building. I think this photograph is from about 1929. Um, he was hired um, on the job and was actually ended up being fired three times, a couple of times because they were just running out of money and another time when uh, uh, people took advantage of him and uh, made him escape the some issue. During this time, he quite frequently came into contact with Hearst, many of his guests, and with Julia Morgan. Um, and th there is a huge amount in the diary about his time at Hearst Castle and the goings on there and descriptions of the people. I think he met Winston Churchill, Bernard Shaw, um, and many other film stars, of course. Um, and there's a nice little description here of actually a little, he doesn't have much description of the gardening that goes on there because he was looking after the animals at the zoo for most of the time. But he does talk about here about the amount of money that Hearst put into developing um, his uh, estate. A half dozen men have been working for six weeks excavating a great oak. When they have cut its foundations, it is to be removed to a different place. Hearst pays sometimes as much as $10,000 for the removal of one of these fine trees. The summit of this hill was carved with a grove, was covered with a grove of wide shining live oaks and a few pepper oaks. Hurst has saved these as much as is possible, has caused palms and flowers to be planted among them, and has 10 gardeners working constantly to keep the grounds beautiful. So that was uh, basically the only description of the gardens at Hurst Castle. But he does give a lot of descriptions of uh, Hurst and his visitors. Um, just again, a little sense of how he writes about Hearst. Here we are in, let's see, this is June the 29th, 1928. So this is before the crash. Hearst has been round the place a lot, and I see him daily. He's a large man, rather ungainly in appearance, but always immaculately dressed. When he addresses a man, he speaks quietly, and seldom, if ever, raises his voice. He's uniformly courteous, and evidently understands most of his guests are hanging around him, catching on his every word to try and get something out of him. Some of the more noted actors and actresses 
uh, with him. I see Charlie Chaplin, Adolf Manjou, William Powell, who are all big enough to stand on their own feet and don't need to suck up to him. And then he goes on with his a lot of information on uh, uh, Marion, of course, here, and uh, the, the young ladies who come up to the, the castle. And one of the more interesting or so amusing little anecdotes that he comes across, uh, he was a Tito, Tito. He never smoked, he never drank. Um, and so he was dismayed when he realized that um, a lot of bootleg liquor was being brought into the castle late at night. Under the castle is a vault with double doors. The keys to this vault are carefully guarded for stored there of vast quantities of liquor. The finest Europe affords, the old bonded whiskies of pre-prohibition pre days, everything procurable has there for his guests. Um, I have seen a ship come alongside the pier at San Simeon unload 14,000 cases. Last year, when on my vacation in San Francisco, um, I saw several Coast Guard officers. He worked, was working the Coast Guard officer, Ryan, and, they, and he told the Coast Guard officers what was going on. Um, they asked who was running booze this way, and I told them, Hearst. Well, we don't want anything to do with Hearst, they declared. Do you suppose I want to be dissed out of the surface or transferred to some cold station off on the New England coast? Tell us something about the smaller fry that we can handle. So he continues to work for on the Hearst uh, property until about 1933 when money was really getting thin. Um, and uh, he's laid off for a while, but gets rehired um, at the Hearst family mansion, uh, which is in Wintu near McLeod in Northern California, uh, by his old boss, who previously was also at Hearst Castle. Um, and uh, this is a place that is very difficult to find. It's stuck back in the woods. There's basically no public access. But uh, Bernard Maybach had originally designed a castle for Phoebe Hurst. Now, this is maybe where uh, the junior got the idea from. Um, but that burned down in 1929. And Hurst again hired Julie Morgan, uh, asking her to design him a new castle to replace the one burned down. Um, uh, Money troubles uh, became much more severe at that time. So she designed a, a much more modest uh, place for him, a sort of Bavarian village of a number of places that looked like this. Uh, but even here, Hearst at this age was still heavily involved in manual labor. He'd been lifting great rocks anywhere from 200 to 1,000 pounds weight into trucks all day long. Um, he does finally get an opportunity to work in, inside uh, the buildings, laying fireplaces and look after as a handyman, but again, he continues to meet a fascinating collection of people. Um, however, um, Wintoon, being where it is uh, in Northern California, is snowed in in the winter. Uh, everybody's laid off, the place is closed up, and he's invited by a gentleman by the name of Frank Preston that he met while he was traveling in Australia in about 1925, who was living in Pennsylvania, Butler, Pennsylvania, to come back there for the winter and basically give lectures to his friends and family and others in the area. So he traveled back there. This is the Nixon Hotel in Butler, Pennsylvania. I believe he stayed here a couple of nights, but most of the time he was with Frank Preston. And people used to enjoy his stories, as I certainly do reading his stuff. They really seem to enjoy my tales of adventure, so different from the rather prosaic business of accumulating dollars, as he put it in 1934. But uh, Back to uh, Wintoon a couple more times. And finally, in 1936, uh, he is laid off for the third time. Um, and he's invited by Frank Preston to go back and work for him to build a, a game preserve and landscape the area around uh, a lab that he is building in the hills outside Pittsburgh. Uh, Preston was uh, an engineer in glass research. And so he stays here for about three years um, and uh, builds, uh, again, miles of fences, removing trees, again, all barehanded, uh, no mechanical aid. And Preston Park still does exist. It's now in the National Register of Historic Places. It's about 100 acres and was gifted by Frank Preston and uh, 
uh, Mrs. Preston after uh, they passed on. And it's open today uh, and has in the description of numerous unique plants, many of which I understand were introduced by uh, our friend Perkins. So in 1938, um, he really can't stand the winters in Pennsylvania anymore, being spending much, so much of his time on the West Coast. And he finally, he moves to Pacific Grove. Uh, the reason he tro chose the town uh, is because it wasn't all cluttered up with bars. And in fact, it was still a dry town the first time I came here in 1968. I think they finally allowed liquor in, in 1939, in 1969. Um, and lived in a converted wash house, basically a shack on Mermaid Avenue near Lover's Point. Um, I continued to work um, as his money accumulated. Uh, un again, unusual for somebody in his uh, capacity. He had saved money putting it away in immunities, in annuities, rather than spending it on wine, women, and the song, as so many of his compatriots did. And he planned to just spend a life reading in the library, lecturing about his travels and doing like gardening for his neighbors. Um, on the left-hand side here is a note from the San Francisco Chronicle in 1940, talking about the talks that he is going to give. Um, so one day um, he noticed children playing uh, on the bluff across uh, Ocean View Boulevard from where he was living um, in Poison Oak. Poison Oak, of course, is very painful if you're susceptible to it, and to, to try to give him some relief, he began clearing the area and planting ground cover. Um, he, I don't know where he got his plants from. He didn't have a lot of money. He had some money, uh, but certainly he chose a number of South African plants that he felt were appropriate for the climate and would be uh, attractive uh, year round. Uh, and the, the dominant ground cover is what he called mesembranthium. Um, and as he says, most of the other plants in the park are African. I wanted to have something to remind me of the dark continent. But somehow I've always loved it above any other land. So Africa was always in his blood. Uh, just a note on his choice of what he called mesembranthium. Today we call it Trisanthium corybundum. And it, it is a form of ice plant, uh, but it is not the eros not the invasive ice plant that uh, is... Uh, such an issue in many areas. Um, it's noted for its erosion control on steep slopes with coarse soil, as well as being drought and salt tolerant, which made it just perfect for the site. Um, and it is a recommended ground cover for the central coast um, by the uh, Cal IUC. So um, this is a picture of Parkett Perkins would be about 1950, so I think this picture was taken. Um, and it was noted in the paper, any day of the week, you can drive down by the ocean. You'll see a tall, spare, deeply suntanned, athletic looking man with no hat and a ball pate working away, building paths, planting flowers, spading and cultivating. And he had no supply of water. Uh, he filled up to 75 buckets of water a day, for two, 75 buckets of water each day for a couple of days a week. Uh, the local motel owner let him do that and then hand carried them across the road to irrigate his plantings. And by 1947, he had extended this garden about 1,500 feet along the bluff top. Uh, this, he had done this all without permission, of course, but people were beginning to appreciate it. Um, city gave him permission to continue, and neighbors who originally were resistant to uh, uh, the work he was doing now were pretty happy about the project. Uh, the service club, which was the forerunner of the Rotary Club of Pacific Grove, organized a flower day, collecting funds on the streets from visitors. Um, and the check, $185, which is worth a little over $2,000 today, he used to augment his personal contributions with uh, plants and other supplies. As the park developed, it became more and more popular. And unfortunately, there were those who did not respect the park. Um, and in uh, 1949, he actually threatened to give up his work and leave town. Um, and uh, thank th thankfully, uh, he was dissuaded from leaving town by the city council. Uh, they decided to honor him with a plaque on the rock that you can see to the left. Uh, Perkins is the third figure from the left in the white shirt and black pants. And 
it was formerly named Perkins Park at this point, um, and luckily he stayed around for the rest of his uh, life in town. He did take a couple of more trips. Um, this time, these times, as a pay, paying uh, tourist uh, from Algeria, he went on a bus through the desert, um, but had to come home uh, because of ill health, and he suffered from all kinds of. Uh, tropical fevers and other things throughout his life as a result of his life over there. And by this time, was suffering badly from diabetes. And on his return to town, he made a proposal to extend the park by uh, another thousand or so feet on the condition that the water, the city would add some water pipes and give him a helper. And finally, in 1953, the council authorized a budget of uh, about twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars value today for manpower, water, and equipment, and he accepted payment of fourteen seventy-five a month. I think if there was a problem with some kind of a pension, he took more. But his rationale is to give me a modicum of authority to hold back vandals, dog owners, who train their pets in the park and bicyclists. Uh, you had to be pretty good if you wanted to uh, spend your time in Perkins. Uh, by nineteen fifty-four. Um, the Herald reported that he had a helper, Manuel Rego. The garden had been extended uh, five-fifths of a mile and cleared for another thousand feet. Eventually, the park was just about a mile long. Um, so over a span of 14 years, uh, he created this uh, linear park along the Blas Ocean View Boulevard. What we're seeing here in this aerial view is about two-thirds of the length going out of the bottom of the picture would have been uh, the rest of the park. And over the years, it became recognized as one of the most unique, um, widely photographed cultural landscapes on the West Coast. Visitors came from around the world, said it was the primary reason for their visit to Pacific Grove, and it continues to be important for that. Uh, but he continued to be dissatisfied with the way the park was being kept. Uh, he actually mentioned this in a letter to a friend of his who was a Monterey super supervisor in 55 while he was on the South American trip. As he points out, these Latin people are 100 years ahead of us in creating lovely flower gardens. If you people would get together in the manner of parks as do these South Americans, his fame would be worth worldwide. Um, in 57, he moved to a retirement home, Forest Hill Manor, the place still exists. And every day he walked downhill to continue working on the garden. Um, and on his way back, go to the council offices and complain about the lack of its appropriate upkeep. Uh, but in spite of his concern about the quality, its flame had spread far and wide, um, and it was appearing in numerous magazines uh, worldwide, essentially. This is a spread from National Geographic in 1959, which is the picture we use for the color of Eden. Um, on the left is a spread from Life magazine. Um, on the right is an example of the Union Pacific Railway's menus that you always put pictures of attractive places on their routes on the front and uh, Perkins Park made the grade. And of course, postcards spread the world across the, spread the word across the world. Um, he claims that sometimes as many as 600 cars per hour went in for this bloom, to say nothing of the huge transcontinental buses, fleets of them. Uh, 600 cars an hour is a lot of cars. It may have been an exaggeration, but I think you get the point. Um, it's kind of interesting in these COVID days, um, while much of the country, of course, is closed down, tourists are flocking to Pacific Road, even though the, the, the flowers aren't open today. It's actually difficult to cross Ocean View Boulevard, whereas I didn't even have to look to know when you were crossing a few months back. Uh, perhaps the most famous picture of the park was taken by Kodak photographer Peter Gales. Uh, he shot this scene in, in 1961 um, for a mural in Grand Central Terminal. They uh, called this uh, mural a display called Colorama. And about every six months, they would display a beautiful part of the United States and someone taking photographs. Of them. Uh, they actually tried to coerce Perkins to appear somehow in this picture. I'm not quite sure how it fit in this, but he declined to pose for the picture in protest against showcasing his hated hordes of cyclists. While I was... Uh, Looking for more information on Perkins to put my uh, article together, I came across uh, the archives at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo 
And there was this uh, little picture caught my eye. Oops. Um, and uh, certainly that was Perkins uh, standing in front of his park. As I delve further into the collection, it appeared that Frank Preston, who was the guy we'll learn later who typed his diaries, had kept uh, many of Perkins' letters. And after Preston died, his wife Jane, noticing that the name Hearst Castle was mentioned in them, didn't know what else to do with them. And so they donated them to the nearest archive she could find to Hearst Castle, which turns out to be at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, I went down to take a look at what other photographs, there were a couple of pictures, but nothing of note, but there was an absolute trove of dozens and dozens of letters between Perkins and Preston from the period 1961 to 1964, which is where I learned much more because he didn't keep a diary after 1936. So this filled in many of the gaps, what was going on in town um, and what life was like and the troubles he was having keeping his park in shape that made him happy. Um, this is a typical letter of his to uh, Preston. He wrote one of these every two weeks. Um, they cover everything from the weather. I think we're having a drought that year, how many whales were coming into the bay, um, what was going on, how badly his garden was being kept up, um, and politics at the time. I suspect that our friend Perkins would have been a, a Trump voter. Uh, he was a very independent man. Um, he hated unions, so he kept men down. Um, and he detested uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, because he considered that Roosevelt managed to get on board by uh, satisfying the, the liquor barons by removing um, prohibition. So. Uh, in spite of that, he uh, continued to, to write. And uh, this is where I learned about the typing of the diaries. Um, apparently, uh, he sent all the handwritten notes and the typing stuff back to his friend, Frank Preston in uh, Pennsylvania. And Preston arranged for a couple of his secretaries to uh, basically type them up in the format you've seen. And again, it's they could just make uh, five carbon copies, which is why the edition is limited to five. Um, and uh, let's see, is any worth quoting here? Uh, basically, he offered to let them the rewrite, re rewrite it if they wished, um, perhaps to make some money off it. Uh, they decided just to type it as uh, he wanted it. And so this is one of the set of diaries that I showed you earlier. Um, and this is the card in the catalog file in Pacific Grove. Um, and as he points out, uh, Perkins had them bound and sent a complete set to Perkins to give to the library. Um, as he says, was just mailing this. This is uh, Perkins writing to Preston. When your post came bringing your letter, I'm very much in your debt for making those copies of my diary. Please too, because you're giving the Royal Geographical Society a copy. As to presenting the Pacific Grove Library a copy, it's very kind of you. Uh, the only possible objection I could have is that there is a possibility of some of my relatives discovering my whereabouts, and I can't find another hiding place. However, I'll chance it. Uh, one relative did uh, discover his hiding place, as we'll talk about shortly, and uh, he was happy about that. Uh, one of the things that uh, I figured out while down in, San, in uh, Cal Poly I'd noticed in the first volume that some pages had been torn out just before the table of contents. And there in the stash of papers uh, was a letter from Preston to Perkins written in 1963, basically saying, I wish to go to the library and get your diary volumes one and two and cut out the three pages of the forward which I wrote and send them to me. In helping to get the diary retyped and bound, I may have become liable for your statements and subject to the same laws of libel as yourself, and all the comments that he was making about Hearst, and but, uh, Hearst wouldn't care, about Hearst's uh, guests and the way they behaved and other things, scared the Jesus off of Preston's lawyer, and so not only asked uh, to remove the forward, they even wanted to remove the name of the bindery from the back of the copy in case they could trace them that way. So please take your knife and cut out the pages or erase thoroughly on the inside cover. Um, and which he did, Perkins tore them out, sent them back to Preston. So the only we, reason we have this is Preston kept the copy that was sent back to it. It goes to Cal Poly as part of his papers, 
and I discover it in the stash there. So we have solved the mystery of why these pages were torn out of the book um, by Perkins uh, forward being left out. And actually it's kind of interesting. He tells us quite a bit more about Perkins and his style um, and the, the friendship they had together in there. So the one relative who did track him down was a guy named John Donaldson. Donaldson, I think, was either a nephew or similar. Um, and he continues quite a good correspondence for just about a year with uh, Donaldson and um, tells him a lot more about some of the stuff that he didn't put in the book, um, especially about the supposed murder of his grandmother. So we'll never know how, what happened here, but it's sort of hidden between the lines in one of these letters. Um, and again, he goes on complaining about uh, the, the city council and uh, why they're not looking after his park. And as he points here, and this is the quote I've got, all my life I have dreamed of a lovely park beside the sea when I grow old. The gang in charge have now placed their fraternal brothers there and it is now largely wrecked. Still, I know the garden as well and they do as much as I say rather than what the so-called uh, experts. So the rest of his life, he was dissatisfied with the state of his park. This is a picture, one of the postcards we came across that he sent to John Donaldson. A couple of pictures of the park as it looked in those days. Um, and this is the last letter, I believe, that he wrote. Um, just a very short letter, March the 17th, 1964. And basically saying is he wants uh, Donaldson to keep all of his papers, the stuff that uh, Preston didn't have, um, I, but I'm fading a lot and don't think I will last much longer. I'm 86 now and will get no longer. This diabetes hurts me a lot and it's almost impossible to get food, decent food here. He complained food about residents every letter he wrote, I think. Um, so, and he died, let's see, about a month later in April 1964. Um, his passing was uh, noted uh, widely in the local press. Um, the council promised that uh, uh, they would have a Perkins Day and uh, he would be remembered. Uh, and he left his entire estate of $6,500 and worth about over $50,000 in today's money to the library for the purchase of his books. Um, he was quite specific about the books, kindly purchased books, Kindly purchase books after my demise as follows, nothing political or religious. He retained his distaste for religious authorities of all kinds throughout his life. Um, only best fiction um, uh, studies on engineering, mechanical training, nothing pertaining to war, farming, geology, flying, any branch of useful science for many boys are okay. As for women and girls, use your own judgment. Um, unfortunately, those uh, funds were long ago spent buying books, though we still have some benefit from them. And uh, his part continued to uh, attract attention well after he passed on. It intermittently it would kelp in good times and would suffer in bad times when the city could not afford the labor. Um, appeared on Life Again in 2005. And as recently as 2019, uh, this picture appeared on the cover of the local tourist guide. Uh, I haven't seen it looking as good as this for at least 10 years, so I think they hold out the whole picture. The problem is, uh, as you all know, gardens are ephemeral objects and they need love and attention all the time. And as he explained so, Ted, to a friend of his, when I am dead, the city will let all my work go to hell. Um, this was a letter by a friend of his, again, to the city council. Volunteer crews were organized uh, every two or three years to clean out the weeds and try to keep it in some kind of shape. This is a picture from the 1982 paper. And then two or three years ago, the city realized that the place was really getting in pretty bad shape and organized, uh, we have a full-time volunteer organizer for the city, Amy, who does a wonderful job of rounding up people to go work both on the park, on the lighthouse, in some of the other parks, uh, but with, the, with a real focus on Perkins Park. Um, and what we see here are some replanting that was done uh, late uh, early last year. Um, but the deteriorating condition uh, continues. You, you can't do this just with volunteers uh, working a few weekends a year. Um, and in fact, uh, I, I took these pictures in just a few weeks ago 
and inspired by Jan Grasic to uh, do a HALS report. I submitted a report in the HALS Vanishing uh, Landscape uh, competition for this year. The city uh, finally realizing that this was an extremely important asset, should not be lost, um, and uh, did uh, hire a, a local land, uh, landscaping company to make rec recommendations on what's the best way to proceed. Do we completely return it to its original state? Is there a mix between um, putting some other South African plants back in there? Or do we just have patches of the magic carpet uh, with native plants uh, around them? Uh, and this was a Zoom presentation that I went to on May 28th. Uh, I am concerned probably that this plan will not be implemented in my lifetime. The city is in such state now that there's going to be no money for a long, long time to do anything here. So thank you for joining me today. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, Perkins and his park, you can read the article, download PDF from the uh, website, or there's an online version. Um, and both these uh, links are to be found on the events tab of our website. So thank you, thank you for joining us today. Um, please visit us, uh, and uh, we'd love to see you again at our next lecture on September the 23rd. Um, and so I will now try to hand this back to Ellen. Ellen, are you in charge or do I need to do something else? I think I'm in charge. Can you Good. hear me? Okay. I can hear you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, David. We do have a couple, it's, it's seven o'clock, so I understand if people need uh, to log off, but we do have a couple questions coming in. So are you available to sure. stick around for a few minutes? Okay. Yeah. Um, the first one I'm seeing here is if this presentation will be available online and I'm working on an answer for that. So we'll get that out quickly. Um, another one I see here from Christine O'Hara is which of the preservation plans do you think the city should develop? Uh, as a historian, I'd love to see it go right back to the original. Um, however, there is a very strong native plant movement in this town. They would love to tear it all out and put in, uh, I keep recommend if you want to put, if you want to put native plants in the most appropriate native plant for that site is poison oak. People are not going to walk all over that and tear it up. Um, but uh, you know, I think there's probably a compromise somewhere between the first and the last uh, version. Put, leave as much of the magic carpet as you can where it's not appropriate for drainage or shade or other reasons then yeah, by all means, let's, let's put some native plants in. Okay. That there are miles and miles and miles of coastline along here, all covered in hot and tod fig ice plant. Let them tear all that out, put native plants in. Don't spoil this historical treasure. Well, we have a couple of questions about native plants as well. Um, here's one from Jennifer. Even though you've said that this plant isn't an invasive ice plant, do you think that it gets lumped in with ice plant and that its reputation has suffered for that? Absolutely. I had to counter that all the time. Um, to me, it's, it's a native to this climate. And there are many mm -hmm. native plants people would like to put in there that are totally ridiculous to try to put along the ocean front of Pacific Grove. The winds won't grow there. Um, and lots of other things like that. So, yes, it, it is a problem. I wished it had never had the name ice plant because it causes uh, that misconception about this particular, there must be thousands of varieties of ice plant. There is one really bad guy, you know. Um, do you, have you noticed if Perkins himself is being referenced or um, if his legacy is understood within the discussion about restoration of the bluffs? You know, I started, when I published this article, I'll bet 90% of people in town had no idea what Perkins Park was but they know everyone knew where the magic carpet was. Um, I've given this talk several times in the town. It's got quite a lot of local publicity. And I, I think the work is getting around. There was an interesting character behind this. And uh, we should all thank him for 14 years of hard labor that he did at the end of his life. Yes, the hauling buckets of water, that's quite <laughs> impressive. <laughs> right. Okay, well, 
I think that's all the questions I see in the chat. Does anybody have a last moment thought? Okay. Well, my understanding about the, the recordation of this presentation is that it will definitely be made available to members and potentially beyond um, on the CGLHS website. So look for an announcement about that. And thank you so much, David, for um, hosting our very first lecture of 2020. And I hope everybody can return for our next lecture, which is Stephen Keelan next month. Um, and it was on your slide, but I can't quite remember what the topic is. <laughs> It'll be posted on the on the Okay, CGLHS check out website. the website so, right. and consider um, joining us for membership. Uh, it's a very affordable membership fee and you get our Eden journals included as well as um, discounted rates for all of our, our events. So I hope to see you on September 23rd. Thank you, Jennifer, for Stephen's lecture and thanks everybody so much for joining us tonight. Thank you everybody for attending. That was fun. Okay. Bye, David. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks, Fiel. <laughs> that was well done. <laughs>